Uh, yeah, welcome. Hope we have a good evening. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get things started off as things should be started off, and that's with a little Kenny Loggins. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs>
hang so high Bring your sweetest child another tree I'll bring mine I wanted to see the morning And I wanted to see the light I think it's a funny story. Um, <clears throat> it's a story about this time that I was almost molested. He hasn't calmed down. I said almost. You know, that's what, that's what keeps this a funny story. Not a therapy session. It's almost. It was a close call. Those are always fun to talk about. But it's a story from when I was like five and I was living uh, in downtown Flint on Hamilton. You guys might know where that is by Angelo's. I lived there. And uh, I had this next door neighbor who uh, I would play with sometimes, even though I was five and he was about probably 12 or 13. But you know, we were, he was a little slow. So we could like kind of hang out and play. And I know saying slow isn't politically correct, but you have to give me a break in this situation because I was five. I was really qualified to properly diagnose him. <laughs> All I knew is that we were betting with the same number of chips mentally. So we'd hang out, we'd play action figures and stuff. And uh, one day, his mom asked, she was like, hey, you guys should have a sleepover. You know, you can come over and stay the night. And I was like, oh, I don't know about that. And, but then she said, well, he, he's got a Power Rangers tent. You guys can set it up in your room, sleep in the Power Rangers tent. And then I was sold. I was like, all right. Man. If I get to hang out in Power Rangers tent, I can do this. So cut to that night. We're at my house, we're in my room, in the Power Rangers tent, playing uh, X-Men action figures, and pretty standard stuff from 1997. And uh, this, is, this is when things got a little weird. He says, hey, this is fun. You know what else would be cool? You should let me touch your thing. And I'm a polite person. I said, no, no, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And he, uh, he was like, okay, but he had a... He had a counter offer. He was like, all right, how about you touch mine then? And I was like, nah. Also, no thank you. And this is when I knew, like, this, we, we weren't going to go back to playing X-Men action figures. <laughs> I could see this was a one-way street of thin touching. I had to do something about it. So I was like, I got to tell an adult. So I go downstairs, and I find 
the most trustworthy adult I know, my 11-year-old sister. Because <laughs> when you're five, an 11-year-old, that's, that's an adult. And I was like, hey, uh, bro upstairs is just trying to, trying to touch things. I'm not 100% down with that. I was like, maybe you could step in and do something. And she just flipped, man. Uh, she was freaking out. She was really scared, like really upset that someone was trying to touch her brother. So she acted accordingly by standing at the bottom of the stairs and yelling up to him, hey, you creep, stop trying to touch my brother. That's gross. I'll kill you. Like, I'll, I'll beat you up if you try to touch my brother. And I was like, well, this is going well. And then, then things got really extreme because uh, he comes out of my room and grabs a baseball bat that we had at the top of the stairs. Ironically enough, for protection. <laughs> he grabs his baseball bat and he starts screaming, Shut up! Shut up! Don't tell my mom or I'll kill you! And then I was like, oh no. <laughs> but luckily that was enough to get actual real life adults involved that weren't 11. And uh, they settled things. They calmed the kid down and uh, they took him home. And his, his mom was apologizing profusely. Like, oh, I promise this, this doesn't always happen. Uh, he's, he's a really good boy and he really enjoys having Seth as a playmate. I hope, I hope the boys can still be friends after this. And needless to say, you know, it's still one of the closest friends I have to this day. <laughs> that's all of this whole story. I'm not going to be up here very long tonight. But thanks for listening. Woo, you guys are great. Yeah. Oh, if you want to hear more horrible stories, uh, they're not all about molestation, but I have other jokes and stories. You can come. I host a monthly comedy show at Saudi Wadi Bar. The next one is April 3rd. We'll be doing a 10 p.m. show there and an 8 p.m. show at the Flint Local before that. So check it out. Great, great. Whoa, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Brian also hosts an open mic night at Lunch Studio every first, every first Thursday of the month. So please check that out. That one was very enjoyable as well. Um, since uh, we haven't really done an awful lot of announcements, I thought I'd mention one or two things. Um, next Saturday, is that right? Next Saturday, the 28th of March, is um, the Voices uh, event. Yeah, Voices. And, uh, I don't often get Saturdays off, but I've requested to have, and I will be getting that Saturday off, and I will be there and participating. It'll be my second participation with this event. Um, maybe, go ahead. I was gonna say, and the day before that is Cool Cities Art Auction. Well, I'll give every, I'll give someone else the opportunity to, okay, because I'm not informed on that one. Okay, okay. Will well, you do the report on Voices? I'm sorry to interrupt. All right, and uh, so basically, Voices is a an ongoing thing that's been for six, seven, eight years, something like that. It's been going on for quite ten years. I, I'm informed. This is a year and a half gap since the last event. Um, and uh, it basically, it, it involves a pairing of visual artists with written artists, written writers. And uh, several people in this room have participated in the recent past, in fact, the last, the last particular one, Jenny Munch and Nick Custer were two participants. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was my first time, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a, Maybe a little bit of a sad element to it in that one of the participants was, was Ryan Bellows. And uh, as I understand it, um, there's going to be a, an area set aside which includes some visual art by, by Ryan. And they're gonna, you're going to encourage any writers to uh, contribute uh, mm -hmm. their thoughts and such yep. to uh, Ryan's um, visual art. Yes. So um, I think I covered a lot of bases on that. Yeah, yeah, you did great. Saturday, 6 to 10. Oh, no, no, no. Noon oh, to 6. Yeah, it's pretty long. Covered myself fast on that one. You came at 6, you'd be sadly disappointed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Set. I'm not going to take up a lot of time tonight. I think I'm just going to do one song. Um, this past Saturday, I attended an event at, um, at the local, 
and it was an acoustic music night. Got to see my friend Seth there. That was great. Um, didn't recognize most of the people there, but I did recognize two of the performers. And so it was, uh, most of the, these people were songwriters, and it was, um, one of the things that kind of stuck out was, because I didn't know all the performers, I got I only knew two of the performers, was that there were two of the, these guys, who, two of them who got up and introduced their song like, uh, basically, um, well, this is the first song I ever wrote, and uh, you can get this on my EP that I'm selling in the back, and kind of left me to wonder about that, because um, my songwriting goes back quite a few years, and I, I know the first 40 or 50 songs that I wrote really stunk to high heaven, and I would absolutely not want them uh, available on a CD anywhere. Um, so, uh, anyway, I got to thinking about that. So my, my um, segues are really clumsy tonight, I'm sorry about that. So I'm going back to voices, the voices of in it. The opening line in this song is, I'm hearing voices from a magic land, and the song's called The Magic Land. I wrote this when I was 20 years old. I want to do this without my glasses. Yeah. Because that, that way, take it off. Don't, 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 because I will. Magic land, take a lifetime for me to decode. Meanwhile, I'm stranded in a fork in the road, chasing choices. But I've never planned hearing voices from a magic land. I want to take you on a foggy night to a vacant grade school playground and dance to the traffic's distant sound just to wake you.
from a magic land. I'm not as prepared as I am in the past, uh, the last few appearances here, so I'm only going to do one more song. Um, but I'm, I'm actually pre performing. Um, Um, the maturation of a songwriter. This is. I could bore you with a lot of details, but this is. This song's called Marguerite. Marguerite, you look so stunning today. Is the stove on? Is the sink running? Is the refrigerator door open? What are the kids? Are they on fire? Janet abruptly rose from a deep slumber, her moo moo, heavy with sweat. Quickly stumbling from her apostrophe, she rushed to her kitchen. Arriving in a bluster, she had forgotten of the one step that separated the hall and the kitchen. Tripping with a thunderous roar, accompanied by a string of drool from her slick mob, she landed in a pile on the floor of her food calcium. Darling her eyes, firstly, to the fridge. 
and then to her sink, and finally to her oven. She was calmed in the knowledge that nothing was amiss. All was well. All was in place. Now get out the kids. The kids! Janet arose in a titanic struggle as her tent-esque clothing had become twisted and tangled in the uproar, managing to plant herself firmly on her feet. A dash would have come next, but she was slow to the uptake, aghast. Janet peered down at her narrow titties, only to realize her left crock had fallen off and was not within sight. A quick glance across what she could see of her kitchen floor told Janet that her comfortable yet awful shoe was nowhere to be found. <sighs> Janet had just purchased those from her local Walmart. But a day prior, $20, gang, $20. <clears throat> Janet was a waitress down at the local dive diner. The truckers and vagrants tipped poorly. She could not afford such a loss. Dropping to her knees, uh, hanging cookware clattered noisily. Janet desperately pawed in the darkness amongst all of the dirt, dust, and grime. There was no sign of her much coveted crack. A lost, oh, well, excuse me, a last pained outstretch of one of her jiggling appendages was met with her rubber treasure. A mammoth sigh of relief filled Janet <laughs> filled Janet's sagging chest. Oh, God! The kids! Janet clambered to her feet, both of which were now bickracked, though her brand of hurried pace lacked the finesse others had. She heaved from out of the kitchen, forgetting that one dastardly step and falling. Doing a clumsy sort of somersault, Janet landed in her living room on her back. She opened her eyes, only to notice above her electric fireplace that no longer worked, her coveted family portrait. So magical, so mystical. But on it, but on the gleaming glass, were streaks. Were streaks. How could she have such an oversight, Janet thought. Streaks in the moonlight? How could this be? Janet demanded. Janet, white-knuckled, realized tomorrow afternoon was when her boss was to visit her house, or her hovel. Ex excuse me, it's a hovel, it's not a house. <laughs> Thoughts of her po poor housekeeping, so blatant. I'm shaking like a leaf over here. Okay, I'm sorry. That was on surface. For a cat. And how it would tarnish her professional image for her boss came roiling in. She would be demoted to dishwasher. Visions of her tortured existence of a lowly dishwasher collided in Janet's noodle. A prune-handed hell on earth was what the fate of a washer of dishes had in store for her. She could, nay, would not go back to that half-eaten water prison. Oh, the portrait! The kids! But the portrait! Street was its visage. She perched upon her back. Janet heaved and hoed side to side, using her momentum to flop on her bulbous abdomen from which she jarred her way onto her feet, determined to cleanse the offending streaks. Now on her feet, Janet scuttled to the cleansing wipes she had stashed near her plush armchair. With, with wipe in hand, she fell upon the frame as a vampire bat would fall upon the wounded back of a cow. To and fro, her hand wiped, obliterating the streaks. <coughs> Different hand, guys. <clears throat> obliterating the streaks to make their presence known. Her boss would gaze dreamily at the frame as its luster was absolute, a potential disaster averted. Janet stood in defense, or in defiance, rather, to the chance of demotion. All was in place. No, 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 the kids, 
She forgot about the kids. Too crisp, they may have become. Janet swiveled in place to face the direction of the hallway. Janet, now facing the hall, had a sole goal in her mind, check on the chillings. Alas, her earlier swivel may have been too vigorous as Janet's mass now pulled her down to the $10 channel rug. With an echoing thud, her side met rug. rug. She would not tear it about this time. She had a fire in her basketball-sized heart and would use this heat as fuel for her charge to the room in which contained her little piglets. With a gargle, Janet jumped to her feet. Well, not, not so much jumped, more of like a slow climb on a nearby chair that had been uh, overturned, but still with fire in her heart. Very fiery, guys. Now on her feet, Janet began her pur purposeful march through the hallway and into the room containing her spawn, her blood, her joy. How could I have worried of a few streaks on a portrait? Janet inquired of herself. Her kids could very well be nothing but <clears throat> more than piles of ashes atop Formula One race car beds. She would know in just a few moments. Janet placed her quivering hams on the burnished gold door handle and turned it. Swinging the door open, she was met with a loud whine, whose origin must have been hinges. She knew she should hit it with one of little spritz of the WD-40. Resisting the urge to go get some 40, Janet flicked the switch to illuminate the room. Lights on. Now Janet could be sure of the safety of her creations. Janet peered at the two race car beds, one red, the other blue, and was met with nothing. The beds were empty. Janet had no children. Oh, shucks, guys. She had never had kids. Worried too much of her professional image and her material worth, she gave no time to squeeze out any heirs or heiresses. Got, got included. <laughs> Among other reasons. A bacon flavored tear creased Janet's eyes. Prioritize your worries, guys. Prioritize your worries. And that uh, was my worrisome story of Janet and her uh, kids. Uh. <laughs> I apologize that these uh, hot babies over here were uh, quivering so much. I, I haven't eaten in about 12 hours. So I think my uh, hunger-induced delirium is getting to me. <laughs> but you know, I did okay. Yeah, you did. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Brian said earlier we got this cool event coming up. Thank you, Kate, for being awesome. We got this cool event coming up that we do every year. It's going to be our 10th one, believe it or not, called Voices. He gave a really good description of it, you know. It's a collaborative event where we're bringing together visual artists and written artists, spoken word artists, rappers, whatever that is, and try to kind of cross mediums and really bring together that definition of what is creative alliance, you know what I mean? It's a free event. It's going to be March 28th, which is Saturday at the GFAC, the GFAC, on South Saginaw Street by Court. Um, it's noon to six. If you don't know what time to come, and you can come anytime, we recommend three o'clock. It's a nice kind of midpoint in the day. We're gonna have some dancers that are interpreting Ryan Bell's uh, paintings and a uh, cool like, dance thing, and all sorts of good open mic stuff throughout the day, as well as a gallery show. So I encourage everybody to come out. If you don't know Ryan Bell's, this is him portrayed wonderfully right here. Um, again, this is a group painting, so if you have anything that reminds you of Ryan or anything you want to add to it, I think this is a good month to have kind of a Ryan Bell's tribute to him. Uh, and real quick, before we get on to the talent, 27th, Art Auction is an event every year. It's a fundraiser for all the galleries. The Creative Minds is doing their part. We got the lunch studio. Um, you have to pay to come. It's a ticketed thing. The tickets night off at most venues are 30 bucks. We will sell you a ticket today, uh, $20, which is the cheapest you're going to find anywhere. And it's a really good way to kind of fund the arts and support the arts. Hey, Greg. So, Greg's a big support of the arts. So, thanks for the time. <laughs> This first song is called Audience <coughs> Number One. It's by Cold War Kids. Yeah. In a 
the universe. Oh, you rock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we like <laughs> Uh... 
gonna sleep from the chandelier, from the chandelier. I'm gonna swing from the chandelier, from the chandelier. extremely hairy, she has four legs, and she barks at any dumb bastard that decides to knock on my front door. Oh. I'm sorry, sister, you know, I apologize, but she's not here, so it's perfectly fine. Um, and we won't tell Also, her. the other day, right, you know, I was with my mom. I'm 16, by the way. You guys, like, you 34? I'm not. I'm only 16. So I was like, Mom, I want a kangaroo. You know, she was like, son, you can't get a kangaroo. I was like, what? You know, and I asked her like 1,344 times. I counted. I'm extremely good at math, right? I was like, Mom, Mom, I want a kangaroo. I want a kangaroo. She was like, I can't get you a kangaroo, but I can get you the movie Kangaroo Jack. I was like, what? So, you know, she was like, you know, get your SpongeBob slippers, you know, get your Dora Explorer cake, and we got the Blockbuster. Mom, Blockbuster doesn't exist anymore because of Netflix, Mom. But uh, thanks for trying. You know, when I went to my room and I was like, I hate Netflix because, you know, Netflix killed my kangaroo dreams. I was so excited. You know, I was like, kangaroo jack, kangaroo jack, go, 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 go. I was excited, you know? Um, that's all I got, you know? And uh, before I embarrass myself, I'm going to walk off. Like I just uh, was on American Idol and I just run. I just won. Wait, not American Idol. Idol girl dress. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Last couple of times we've, uh, we've had to put up with Terry. Hoping this and he doesn't. <laughs> It's not much of a rowdy, a rowdy. Everybody doing okay? Yeah. I'm enjoying this tonight. Kind of a mixed bag. Wouldn't want to have this all guitar players and uh, 
a lot of enjoy the music that has happened so far. And Dante, I told him, uh, I just met him a little while ago, and I said, he reminds me of a young uh, Muhammad Ali. Oh, yeah. Good well, looking young man. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Got three songs, and they should fall within the 15-minute time period. If they don't, then Al's got this big old like a cane or a hook. Yeah, right? a hook. Ooh, he pulls you off, so you got to stuff ready. Yeah. Got his strength. She's one of those girls who comes in the spring. When you look in her eyes, you forget everything. Two guys got together, and uh, Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan were, were close at one time. I'd say back in the late 60s, Johnny Cash had his own television show, and Bob Dylan um, made appearances on there, and they, they collaborated on this song. And uh, let me get my pick out here. They used to hang out, and I... Back in those days, Johnny Cash was in real good shape. I, uh, I suspect that uh, he was under the influence of things from time to time there. They got together and, and wrote this song, and it's a little wordy. I mean, that would, uh, that must have been Dylan's part of that, because he has, you know, his songs have lots of words. Anyway, this is, uh, this is called Wanted Man. Thank you. 
Perfect. Yeah, we're right. We got one more song, and uh, Jenny's had this uh, this contest of the uh, the flint. Yeah. Is it still on? The flint song contest. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, I was thinking of my head that I wanted to start talking about that. So you can talk about that. that would be great. Well, you, you know more about it than I do. I know it's been going on for some time. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to, you know, I submitted the song. I'd yeah. like to just change it a little bit. A little sure. Bit to yeah, it. send me, I'll use the latest uh, version that you, or whatever version you want me to use. The authorized edition. Yeah. yeah the yeah. authorized edition. And then uh, in May of, uh, May, is, May's Clab Night is going to be the last one that you can go to to submit a song. So so wait, why would I submit a song? What's the point? Because you get, okay, when you play their song, because we videotape everything, then uh, I take that videotaped version of the song, and it's going to be a Flint song. It's going to be a Flint song. So, well, Flint, just, you know, if you got a song, just throw the word Flint in there a little bit. Okay, and then, uh, and then we're going to have like a public vote on uh, June's Art Walk Night. So that's like the, the uh, every second Friday. And then I'm going to uh, project those songs, and I'm going to give people ballots, and whoever wins the popular vote gets their song wins. Well, they get to be mayor? It, what? They get to be mayor? Um, yes. Maybe. I don't yes. know. Um, it doesn't matter anyway. You don't get to do anything you want to do anyway. It's the chocolate key to the city. Did you guys want to know what the prizes are? Wait, wait, wait. There's prizes? There's prizes. 50 cents? Okay. I'm trying to put together like a little publicity package for the winner. So that means that first off you get five hours of studio time here with Ken. So you can make a good yeah. copy of your yeah. Flint song. Then you get to play your Flint song on Kettering Radio. And you also get interviewed by Tom Sumner on his the radio. Tom he'll let you, he'll let you play your song. Good. And then your song is also going to be, you get to, to uh, play it during aerosol and audios event that they have every year, you know. And then you're going to also get to play it at Ju well, June, June Green. Green. And then also Juneteenth. You get to play it on stage during that, during June. And um, it, it, the list just keeps growing. So I, I mean, I might have missed a few. Oh, you get to be on the favorite line show. And so if we like his song tonight, we vote in June that we like it. Yes. But you can, you can look at them all. They're all on the website, uh, the Creative Alliance Facebook page. That is a good place too, by the way. If you want to know what's going on, I try to share all musical, artistic events and uh, you know, call for artists and stuff on that page. What? Oh, the song contest. You have until May to collab night to play your Flint song. Okay. All right, Jim. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. So uh, I had done this song once, and uh, since I since I wrote the song, a few things, a few uh, issues developed in Flint. And I thought we're only right to go back and address those. And that's oh, what the great. politicians okay. always say. Oh, we're going to address those issues. Right. Yeah, right. right. Well, I can do shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it sounds good. I'm here to tell you about my town. Firefighters too, this ain't house on the river and the man. 
German movie, Wings of Desire? Yes. Okay, well this is sort of the Irish version of that.
change your strings more than once every six months, especially if you're playing really low tuning. <laughs> Since the solo guitar thing seems to be a bit rusty, for reasons unknown to me, I'll sing again. Also, kind of Irish here.
All right, this first song I'm going to do is an uh, entry for the Flint Song Contest. Oh, yeah. Oh, another one? Mm -hmm. Or are you just playing one you already have? Yeah, this is a new entry. A new entry. Oh, yes, right, right, right. Okay, good, do that one. It's a, uh, it's a version of an old Johnny Cash, uh, John Conley, Ray Charles, a bunch of country singers did it back in the 70s. It's a song called Busted, and uh, I rewrote it, gave it modern lyrics. Um, I just call it Flint's Busted. Inside and die. 
about um, singers versus singer-songwriters, <laughs> and I always, I guess kind of, a lot of really popular vocalists over the years, they always kind of sold them, sold them a little bit short because they didn't write their own songs, and uh, one of the really premier vocalists probably of the last half century is Elvis Presley, and I always thought, you know, he didn't write any songs, and then I found out that he did write a song, he wrote one song, and he probably wrote a lot of songs. He wrote one song that was published or recorded or whatever, and it's really a good song, and uh, he had a different attitude about it up after this. Together 
with suspicious minds And we can build our dreams on suspicious minds Senior Center, and when I tell people that, they think everybody there's 90. It's oh, a, you are. It's just a <laughs> building that they let me use. <laughs> Quite a few of the seniors that are members there come down and listen, but we usually get uh, anywhere from 8 to 10, sometimes 12 for performers. It's usually a pretty good night. Um, they have coffee, donuts, popcorn, so it's a lot of fun. Geritol, the pens. Yeah. Hey, come on, knock it off. You're going to get old someday and I'm going to come kick your ass. I'm already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it looks like Daniel must be the clouds in my eyes. Yeah. This is the little shingling tune I wrote. It was like, I don't know, 20, it's called Every Time.
Brenda Fazir. I just came from work. So that's why I'm not dressed up anymore than I am, but I could have nobody else to do this, so. Where's Katie? I just uh, told Katie that I was going to say this for the benefit of everybody. When you get up here and screw up and make a mistake, you really give a gift to everybody because everybody else is saying, wow, you know, she made a mistake, so I can make one. You just make it a little easier for everyone, so you just do it a really nice favor for everybody. That's why I do it so often. I'm yeah, that's either way to go. That's what we're doing. So, um, I'm going to do a, a poem with two songs, and the poem is this. It's a spring theme. Spring is not quite here, but it's basically just about here. So, this is uh, sp uh, spring. It goes like this Spring is here. Oh, it's almost summer. Winter is gone. That was a bummer. I like the rain and the apple tree. I like you, and you like me. I just love to play in the mud. I just love to kiss your face. I just love it when you just love it. My life is yours and mine. I love you when you feel bad. Do you love me when I feel sad? When you feel better, I feel glad. Life is yours and mine. I just love to play in the sand. Squeeze your hand and dance to the band. Squeeze your hand and take my stand. Life is yours and life is mine. Thank you. I keep thinking that, that, could, that I could set that to music, but it never happens, and I keep thinking about what can I put to that, and I never come up with what I can put to that. But this one does have a tune. It's a song that I wrote for a summer camp when I worked at a summer camp when I was at the University of Minnesota called Camp Kichiyapi. Isn't that nice? Does that mean? Yeah. Don't ask such hard questions. <laughs> That's a surprise. Camp in Minnesota. Yeah, it was a uh, some kind of a Native American name, I think. Yes. Which I, it sounds like it. Yeah. Or at least a mangling of it. Yeah. yeah, mangling, mangling, mangling. <laughs> yeah. I played the mangling. See, I got a loop going on. Mangling, <laughs> mangling, mangling. Man. Someone help me get off this loop. Ah, tell me stick another quarter in me so I can get off this loop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, the day is underway, why don't we go out and play? High the sun is in the sky, everything's shaking, why don't I? Jay is calling, Red is tripping, Robin is a strong tree. Pokemons are poking, people snakes are slight, why don't we? Bunnies are popping, bunnies are popping, nothing's stopping you and me. The road is blowing, wind is blowing, I'm a going up to sea. Hey, the day is underway. Why don't we go out and play? High sun's in the sky and the chicken white and white. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm going to make this. Now, this you may recognize. Uh, so <laughs> when you do, give some sort of a shout and make a fool of yourself in, in the way of your choice, okay? <laughs>
Have a great night. Is there time? I to say, sir. Hmm? It's a lot of face. Oh. Are you sitting standing? Uh, I want to stand. Okay, do you want to hold it? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, she wants to hold the mic. So. No, I want to hold the mic. Just hold it like that? Like, we get it. <laughs> Oh, you don't want it like that. Uh, no, no, lower. Okay. No, okay. This would be our unintentional slapstick act. <laughs> I'm the butt of the jokes, as I'm the asset of everything. Oh, and that is. Here we go. That's Amy. Oh, sap. Sap. I'm very sorry. Oh, sap. Oh, sap. Oh, sap. Oh, sap. Oh, sap. Oh, sap. This is actually my first time being here and actually being on any type of stage. Oh. Lay all my music and just like put it in a box in my closet. Like, I'm gonna start doing something. So I'm gonna, yeah. do a little, I'm gonna do a little poem real quick. Okay. Sure Girl, look at you. You got your makeup on. You never look natural. These females hating on you because they boyfriends get at you. But the fact is, you hate yourself. That's why you tend to paint yourself. Well, because of the rainbow, you sit in the rain clothes. From the tears running down your face to the pain that nobody knows. And as you look into the mirror, you see that your hate your grows, and as you squeeze into tight clothes, your ego will overload, and I know. Mm. Reality you struck you. When your mama said you're pretty, don't worry about nothing. Mm. But pretty is, on, pretty is not skin deep, and beauty is just a word. How can you even be a hoe when you cannot even be hurt? Did this over um, Nas affirmative action beat? But oh, so. shit. Let's get it. Alright. So over the years, I pray God trouble my fears and wipe the tears from my mother's eyes as she cross her kids off will fall into God's hands and listen to the wise man. Instead of falling to place society has a hand and take notes with me coats for bear my soul. Won't have me living for the lonely goals with my goals to grow. Some of do this just for fame with their lonely souls, but I'm trying to make a name for my name so the people know. Little girl got some in the flow, spin a legal message through my lyrics like I was Mexico. Sitting here on my knees, I pray to Jesus to let these know. Stress don't feel my mother's heart, but success don't feel the soul. And as I envision missions living like bridges and bad, with my little sisters living a life of their wishes, Ooh, only less than they can call a man. It's that you can't stand. That they be better by the hands of a common man. And if you can't take the words from my pen and understand, I'm trying to rebirth the generation we live in. As the nation we say was wrong, was right, was sin, I will not fall into their plan. I will never give in. Just begin to tell the truth about some juice or some jam. If my friends were good girls turning to sins, on the God say this nation that the devil made. Y'all, it's mad at the rich because you ain't never paid. So, <laughs> So I have uh, three things prepared. One of them is a song that some people might know, uh, Road to Nowhere by Talking Heads. Maybe. I don't know. I'm old enough to know. Uh, and then the next two are going to be things that uh, I wrote. So I'm just going to start.
on a ça. down by the port where the barely dead fish were being thrown onto never-ending ice. A smile on my face, a smile because of what was happening at the tip of every finger, starting with each opposable thumb, then crossing the median between my two hands. The sky had thinned into a loft of gray salt and a slight breezy static. The neutral colors and the makings of an electrical outlet that I will never have the ability to comprehend. Maybe he saw the smile on my face. Maybe I was smiling. I might not have been. The man who sat on the corner near the market entrance, the best place to reel them in. Now that I think about it, I did not have a smile on my face. When the man said, I am a veteran, I am wounded, do you have a dollar that I can have? I said, I'm sorry, sir. I used the word sir out of respect for his sacrifice for this country. Sir, I cannot give you a dollar, sir. I cannot give you a dollar because I smiled or a dollar because I lied. I cannot give you two dollars in all, two separate dollar bills and the cord that attaches my computer to the wall. There's always a chord up here that I trip on. It never, never feels. All right, back to poetry. The flag. I remember a time when the flag's red and white teeth were more like a horizon. It was summer and the Olympics were on television. It was winter and the Winter Olympics were on. I paused to daydream before the front steps of my elementary school where the flag slowly picked up in the wind like a casual observer. The snow was very soft. The red was autumn red. The blue was the base of a flame below a kettle whistle. Each star was a cartwheel and a carnival, and the flag, man, the flag, 
was above us all. We watched on as the athletes watched the flag as it rose a notch above the second and third place flags as the anthem once again finalized the outcome. There was no reason not to feel somewhat relieved and we were all free to watch the flags red, white, and blue gradually turn to steel in what became a stiff, frozen wind. We were free to watch the fiery initial stages of a flag as it burned until it became nothing. Free to be informed by the media, free to listen to our auditory hallucinations. The flag did not tell the story, only wrapped itself inside it. Outside the car dealership on a winter night, the spotlight that features the flag as it steadily convulses in the wind, the red ribbons and the star-filled blue margin, the great big blue of night and the glitter of each snowflake within the lighted path, always silent, especially when no one is around to verify that they are indeed rising and falling. I normally have stuff to say. I don't, I, I don't, I'm just going to keep going. Doing good. All right, then. Something made. One would no longer need a tool in order to rip the payphones from the wall beside the airport terminal, removed because they were not air if you think about it long enough. If you think about it long enough, your physical body finds the ghosts of those machines in a foreign place in another city made by the sounds, made by a radio, made by the soul of a sewing machine that stitches each stitch a leap along the railroad tracks that lead further and further away. Anyway, who do we think we are, really? Certainly the phones were nothing to scoff at. A perfectly aligned vacancy, not a nothing, but a something turned into exactly what might cause one to mistake it for nothing replaced by something else made. One more. In this world that we live in, headed home on the highway after work, the exit signs brighten one after the other in a row. I know exactly where I am, but only in relation to the highway, the grid, the featureless night is a dark, mysterious place that I do not actively participate in. In this world that we live in, we make choices, such as whether to get the chicken tenders at Arby's or the filet fish at McDonald's. <laughs> we could also just go straight home and nuke a veggie burger. We are driving in our car that guzzles gas after a crappy day at work fearful of the possibility that its engine will quit on us. We want to relax, but we just had the chicken tenders. We didn't simply go home and eat what we have already paid for. We could have had the filet of fish and saved three dollars, and not eaten the flesh of the smarter animal. Tonight, as always, the immediacy of a force that cannot be identified Far away and just below the surface of our skin are the pieces of an unconfirmed, much larger promise. Tonight, we have already eaten, but as always, we already want to eat more. Thank you. Alex. Alex went off. Alex went and I would never bet on a chicken ever being the smartest animal, smarter animal. Jen would be next. Oh, we, Jen? 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Oh, here she is. Big hand for Jen. She's a lot of so just cheer for her. Yes. You can do it. And it's all yours. Hi, everybody. It's been, like, it's been like three years since I've read a poem up here, so it's been a while. So. Welcome back. Thank you. I think I might sit. Okay, <clears throat> so I wrote this poem a few weeks ago, kind of had some stuff to it, so, okay, here we go. With a fleeting heart and hope in my mind, I close my eyes and go back in time. 
to a world where we were endless, where life was simple and effortless. And sometimes when I think of you, I feel you are a distant star, and I'm hungry to reach you. But this light is from tens of thousands of years ago, and maybe there is you, no you, no star, just a dream that haunts my mind. But I will tell you, you are the most real thing to me, more real to me than anything. Like I've known you my whole life, for thousands of years, life after life. We come together again and again, finding each other through the centuries. And I ask you, will you travel with me to the Scorpio constellation? Fly with me where our destinies were created. And the old ones say, when two Scorpios meet, they create a fire. Well, it's a clash of fire against fire, and that we will only burn one another. But I choose to see it as a light brighter than any star. And if you do look off into the distance, our light has yet to go out. And with a tired heart and you on my mind, I open my eyes back to the present time. And I will continue to look for that light, for the day that the light is back in your eyes, to that light that I remember. Thank you. Uh, we're going to do something we've been practicing on for the last couple of weeks. Um, nothing special. We just thought we'd come up here and practice.
pieces on the it. Go ahead, go ahead, Jesse, go ahead. <laughs> you want to do that one? Do yeah, it. do that. Well, I only know bits and pieces of it. That's all right. We're here to practice.
Alright, uh, this is a uh, single off of my album coming out soon. It's called uh, Taking Flight. Jenna, right? One. Yeah, so Jenna, yeah. Got one. Okay. We want Jenna to you play. You can get $5,000 if you apply for the scholarship. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> 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 that's like, cool. Wait, listen. I'm sorry. Okay, so. Well, my mic. I'm sitting down tonight, I think. I might have to pop up on this one. Okay, so earlier today, I was sitting and I was talking about like, I don't know, funny things that happened when I was a kid. And I said, oh yeah, it's open bikes. I gotta tell the story that you was laughing and it was rolling on the floor. So anyways, if you guys um, look at my hands, you're gonna see a bunch of little tiny scars. And this is the story of how I knew that I wanted to be an interior designer when I grew up. And 
So when I was three years old, um, I lived in seven different states before I went to kindergarten. And so when I was three, I hear Dorito bags in the back. Yoshi and friends. You're really even lie down here. It's like, look at it as a lot. All right, so when I was like three, we were at my grandmother's in North Carolina. My grandma says, hey, come outside and hang laundry with me. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'll go hang laundry with grandma. So I started heading out the door, and my mom decides that it's nap time. Now, most of you guys weren't like from the 60s, but it was really normal in the 60s for your parents to have like belts like embedded in their wrists, like Spider Man. And so, like, you know, psh, psh, whatever you were doing, you know, and they had wooden spoons laying on the table, and I don't know, we got beat to oblivion, and, and it was okay because that was how society was. So, this is my mom. She's not doing anything wrong, it's just my mom, and we're in the 60s, so here we are. So, she's like telling me, you're gonna go take a nap, and I'm like, no. I'm gonna go hang laundry, and my mother's like, no, you're taking a nap, and because I'm three and I know everything, I'm like, no, I'm going to hang laundry. Well, about the third time she said, you're taking a nap, I turned around, and with both fists, I just pushed them and punched out the storm glass window on my grandmother's door. And, you know, like, now if you hit glass, it just falls into little pieces, not then. It was like shards, and all those shards went into my little three-year-old hands, which now I have all these scars on them. So. I knew this was real. And so, my mother being like furious, instead of trying to chop my head off, dragged me to the bathroom. And her normal, wonderful words of wisdom, she was doing timeouts before anybody else. She said, stay in there until you can learn to behave. And she slammed the door. So I'm three, so now I'm in the bathroom. And I'm all upset because I'm mad because I didn't get to go outside. And, I think she did put like, I don't know, like got the glass out of my hand or something, put a towel around it, whatever. And so I'm mad because I didn't go outside and hang laundry, care less about my hands or anything. But as a good three-year-old does, all of a sudden, I spied the toothpaste. Wait, what? Wow, the toothpaste. So I go over and I got the toothpaste and I took the toothpaste and I went up the wall and down the wall. And up the wall, and down the wall, and up All the wall, up. down the wall, and across the top, and across the sink. I toothpaste everything I could get my little three-year-old hands to reach to. And then I spied the toilet paper, and I wallpapered the whole bathroom. I like wallpaper the bathroom. And I was having an absolutely delightful time and then I heard my mother's hand on the doorknob. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Frozen in time. Yeah, my mom, she came in. She wasn't happy. I think she sort of like grabbed me by my little red curls, dragged me out. And I, I think that like at that point, it was like nap time. She was like, okay, like I'm done with it. I, was, I told y'all yeah, so many times. I think I wonder how my mother ever surprised, like survived my childhood. So anyways. I don't know, I just want to share that. That's how I knew I was going to be an interior designer. It's toothpaste yeah. and toothpaste. And now I have a thing to work with So, I'm leaving you with this little thought. My friend Meyer Hicks wrote this short, tiny little poem. Smiles are like chicken pox. Once one pops out, they pop out all over.